Hi guys, it's Tony Robbins. You're listening to Habits and Hustle. Crush it. Today on Habits and Hustle, we have Dr. Stephen Gundry. He is one of the world's top cardiothoracic surgeons and a pioneer in nutrition. He's also the author of many New York Times bestselling books, including The Plant Paradox, The Longevity Paradox, and his newest book is called The Energy Paradox, What to Do When You Get Up and Go has gotten up and gone. Uh, Dr. Gundry and I speak about lots of things nutrition. Some of it's a little bit controversial, um, as you will hear in the the podcast, Um, but he's definitely someone that has shifted how people um, think about nutrition. He's also an expert in the microbiome and spent over 20 years in gut health, mitochondrial energy and production. And um, anyway, it's a, it's a quite an interesting episode. Hope you'll enjoy it as much as I enjoyed speaking with him. Well, thanks for coming on the podcast. It was fun doing your podcast just before this, and now you're kind of doing mine. Um, and you know, I, I, I'm very excited to talk to you because you've been kind of a you were kind of a controversial figure for a little bit with your plant paradox and. Uh, although that book stayed on the New York Times bestsellers list forever. How long was that book on? Uh, I think it was on 30, 34 weeks. And it's it's been translated into 36 foreign languages. And yeah, it's, um, and it yeah. still does very, very well. Yeah. yeah. You know what I find? It's, this is why I find very interesting. Like a lot of people who say certain things, right? People all like just like poo-poo on them and they're crazy and this. And then like years later... The data proves it, right? But people haven't, you're just like too early on to, people don't adapt or adopt until way later on. And then you're the genius, right? So I, I, I find those things super interesting, you know? Yeah. Uh, and well, sorry, go ahead. You're going to say something or? No, if we, if we get a chance, you know, I, I mentioned on, on, on my podcast with you, um, my first book, uh, Dr. Gundry's Diet Evolution, I actually had an entire chapter on intermittent fasting, on time-restricted eating. And my editor, that was at Random House, Heather Jackson, said, no, we're cutting this chapter. This is too crazy. This is nuts. You're crazy enough as it is. No one is going to believe this. I said, no, 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 no. You know, Here's all the data in the chapter. Here's the references. I've been doing this personally for six years now. I'm using it with my patients. She said, no, I'll tell you what. You get two pages to make your case, and, but everything else is getting thrown out. And I went, ah. so there's two pages. And she came up to me at the Mind Body Green meeting uh, pre-COVID, and uh, she said, you know, congratulations on the plant paradox. And she said, I got to apologize. She said, I shouldn't have taken that chapter away from you. You were so far ahead of your time, and I, I realized I should have believed you. She said, how did you know? I did. I, you know, I told you. She said, I should have oh given, no <laughs> given you the chapter. Just thought you'd like you, to know. How many years ago was that, first of all, you said? The, first book. The, book was, the book was published in 2006. And that was so, long before the 5-2. It was long before Jason Fong. Was, it was the first, as far as I know, it's the first book right. I ever talked about. Two funny things. Number one, Heather Jackson is my editor too, which is very <laughs> funny. <laughs> she was on my last book, uh, not on all of them. So I, so I know the name. Um, and secondly, I find that very interesting because again, it's like now that is not only just a buzzword, intermittent fasting, uh, time restricted eating. It's literally like, I feel like everybody has even if anyone has not heard about it, I mean, they must be living under a rock. That's all that anybody's speaking about now. And so that's very interesting because number one, in your new book called The Energy Paradox, you talk a lot about time-restricted eating um, as it pertains to someone's energy and uh, mitochondria health. Uh, so let's talk about how it does affect your mitochondria health and your energy. And I also want to make a note here that you do an extreme version of it where you actually, you're, you restrict your eating to two hour windows six months of the year is that true yeah during the week uh, five days a week from january 1st to june 1st 
Uh, I eat all my calories in a two hour window, um, Monday through Friday. That have, how long have you been doing that for? This is my 21st year of doing okay, that. Okay, so why, okay, so you're, but you're saying everyone, no one can start off that way. So let's first talk no. about, well, why, why do you do that? Why do you do the two hour window? What's the benefit so, of that? Um, it actually, I think, and there's pretty interesting evidence, particularly from uh, rodent studies, that the tighter we restrict that eating window, the more longevity benefit we get, the more health span benefit we get, the, believe it or not, in animal studies, the less amyloid formation we get. And I go into the studies, uh, they're all, they're, they were done by Dr. DeCabo at the NIH. And I was a fellow at the NIH early in my career. And um, it, 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 it gets kind of nerdy, but kind of fun. Um, and I've written in the, in the longevity paradox, there were, there were two competing studies of rhesus monkeys on calorie restriction. And one of them came out of the University of Wisconsin, the other one came out of the NIH, the National Institutes of Aging. And they were on a, these rhesus monkeys were put on a, about a 35% calorie restriction, followed for all their lives against rhesus monkeys that are allowed to eat normally. And the, they both had incredible improvement in health spans. These animals were healthy almost to the day they died. Um, the University of Wisconsin study actually showed improved lifespan. The NIH study didn't. And there was a lot of argument among longevity researchers, including me, as to why that was. And long story short, many of us argued that Although the diets were similar, the uh, University of Wisconsin diet actually had lower protein. And the um, NIH diet actually had higher protein. And so a lot of us argued it was the amount of protein that made the difference. And I've argued that in, in all my books that protein's overrated if you want to live a long time. But so enter Dr. DeCapo. And he says, you know, I think you guys are all wrong about this. I think it was the fact that when you restrict somebody's calories down to not much and it's put out for you, you're going to eat it very quickly because you're basically starving. And so these calorie restricted animals were eating a, a very limited time period. He says, I think it was the amount of time they weren't eating that was actually the benefit of the, of the calorie restriction. So he, he designs a, a trial with about 300 mice, and there's six groups, but we'll break it down really easily. Three groups of mice got the University of Wisconsin diet. Three groups of mice got the NIH diet. So just to be clear, all of, both diets were 65% carbohydrates. They're mice after all. So one group got to eat all they wanted, the normal amount all day long. A mice eat mostly at night. The second group were calorie restricted, either with the University of Wisconsin or the NIH diet. So they only got you know, 35%, they got 35% less. But it was put out at three o'clock in the afternoon. And that's a really important point. The third group got all they wanted to eat, but it was put out at three o'clock in the afternoon. So you've got the all day munchers, you've got the binge calorie eaters that are they're calorie restricted they eat everything within one to two hours and then it's gone so they're fasting about 22 hours a day and then you got the mice that they start eating at three o'clock and they finish most of their food in about 10 to 12 hours and then they're not eating the rest of the day so they follow them throughout their lives and the punchline is what he did since we were talking about energy both of the mice that the food was put out at three o'clock in the afternoon uh, had metabolic flexibility. Their mm -hmm. mitochondria could shift from glucose to fatty acids on a dime, no problem. The all day munchers couldn't, they had no metabolic flexibility. The calorie restricted mice lived about 30, 35% longer, like all other studies show. 
But the punchline is that the mice that ate the normal amount of food but had a time-restricted window lived 11% longer than the mice that ate the exact same amount of food that munched all day. And if you, if you take that to a human level, that's adding 10 years lifespan to a human. Um, I kind of like the idea of 10 years of lifespan, um, good lifespan. And then w- when they broke it down even further, interestingly enough, all mice die. We're all going to die. The mice uh, had very little amyloid plaque, either in their intestines, where it originally comes from, in their brains. And the mice that ate the, interestingly enough, higher sugar and higher fat diet, uh, which was the University of Wisconsin diet, uh, actually died mostly of liver cancer, which mice often do. But the long story short is that calorie restriction, the diets made absolutely no difference. It was the compression of the eating window that made the difference. So then if you're eating, you're saying, but you said the mice were eating a normal amount of calories in that, in that time window. What happens Correct. if you are, right? But what happens if you binge in that two hours? Like if I'm only Doesn't eating matter. once a day and I can eat like 5,000 calories and I won't Correct. have any effect, I, I, will, I, I will actually live longer. Will I lose weight though? Would I, yes. all those other benefits? All, you will get all those other benefits. So if I'm watching wow. Netflix... Yeah, it's amazing. If I'm watching now, Netflix, I'm watching a movie and I'm and I'm just stuffing my face for a two hour movie, that yeah. will be fine if I don't eat the rest of the day. That will be fine. But like I said, now you don't take this information and say, I'm going to eat a pound of M M&M and M peanuts as my major meal for the day, as long as I can pack. Yeah. No, that's not what I'm saying because, quite frankly, the people, the mice that were eating the higher sugar diet. Um, actually had the most liver cancer so right well because sugar is a whole other element we're going to talk that's about. another so story yeah. that's a whole story we're going to talk all about the sugar so in that two hour time restricted eating that you do what are you eating what's that what do you typically have well so you know for instance uh, dinner last night was uh, shaved uh, artichoke hearts and avocado salad with some parmesan cheese on top of it and i followed that up with grass-fed rajaula with arugula and parmesan cheese and i dumped about i don't know a quarter of a cup of olive oil on both of those and a cup of olive I, oil a quarter of a cup of olive oil on each okay so okay. i i, I oh. try to yeah i try to i try to go through a liter of olive oil per week a liter. A week. That's a, a lot week. of olive oil. It's about 10 to 12 tablespoons a day. And I do that because there are multiple studies showing that probably the magic amount of olive oil for perfect health is about a liter per week. That, wow. A liter a week is, a, that's a lot of olive oil. That's a lot of olive oil. And so and where that yeah, tell me. Go ahead. And you're not you're not drinking the olive oil or using the olive oil to have oleic acid, which is the major component of olive oil. You're actually looking for the polyphenol content, and it's the polyphenol. It, the olive oil is merely a delivery device for polyphenols. And in my first book, one of my sayings is "more bitter, more better." And the more bitter the olive oil is, the more polyphenols are present. So you want to get really bitter, really high polyphenol olive oil. So could you talk about polyphenols a lot in your book, or is maybe not in this one, maybe the longevity paradox. You use polyphenols as a really big immune system booster, correct? Is that what you talk they, about? They, they boost everything you'd care to think about. They boost you know, brain health. They, brain, they boost immune system health. They're, they're just, you know, a fascinating bunch of compounds that plants make to actually boost their health. Um, Polyphenols come from plants, and there's been evidence that plants that are under stress, whether they're underwatered or they're not fed well or they're at high altitude and closer to the sun, they actually produce polyphenols to protect Believe it or not, their mitochondrial function. And yeah, that's what 
they make polyphenols to protect their mitochondria. And that's, uh, interestingly enough, we know that great, great wine comes from stressed vines and from vines that are grown at high elevation. And so it's the polyphenol content that these grapes, these vines make that actually are, are delivered into the fruits. And it's the same way with, uh, for instance, the leaves of fruiting vines and trees actually have far more polyphenol content than the fruits themselves. So, wow. th so that's why I take olive leaf extract in addition to um, having olive oil. The leaf of so okay so the where else can besides the olive oil and plants what are the main sources that people can get polyphenols the main that you that, that are on your list of so uh, one of great sources uh, black coffee uh, any of the teas are great sources uh, cacao chocolate is a great source of polyphenols uh, berries, the skin actually has the polyphenols, and that's where the benefit is. Citrus, believe it or not, the, the peel and the white pith is actually where most of the polyphenols are in citrus. And um, that, so those are, that's a good starting point. And so, but you're not a big fan of fruit though, correct? Like you're not. So yeah, one of my favorite sayings is give fruit the boot. <laughs> But right, that's good. I didn't want to say it. I'm glad you did. Right. So, well, believe it or not, in my first book, and it's going to get a, it's going to, I'm going to revise it again soon. Um, what I urge people to do is get a juicer and get a Jack LaLanne juicer. Um, you know, like, I don't know. You love bucks. Jack LaLanne. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and take your fruit and get organic fruit, as I talk about in the book, and put it through a juicer throw the juice away and then take the pulp and the pulp is the polyphenols and the fiber. And then what you do is you, you mix it in coconut yogurt or goat yogurt or lava, my new favorite yogurt, and, or put them into ice cube trays and freeze them and then throw them in your smoothie. And so you get all the benefit of fruit without the fructose. And one the reason I'm not against fruit, I love it. We're designed to love fruit. We gain weight during fruit season. That's what we were designed to eat. Great apes only gain weight during fruit season. But unfortunately, our fruit has been bred for sugar content. And I mean, sadly, like I talk in the, in the book, a cup of seedless grapes, and that's not much has more sugar than an entire Hershey's candy bar. It's like, what? Um, it's unbelievable to me that, that I, you make that reference about a Milky Way versus like a, I don't know what fruit it was. Is this, you, you, you kind of like equal, equal them to be the same. But how yeah. about, I mean, that's so crazy to me. I mean, you never hear anyone say, you know, I got fat eating too much, you know, I don't know apples and oranges but the truth of the matter is if i was being honest and people who know me know this is true i'm a massive fruit addict and i can eat pounds of it and it's because i'm like i'm a sugar addict and instead of psychologically eating 10 milky ways sure. i'll have right i'll have like a pound of cherries a pound of grape literally i'm not even exaggerating and i do gain weight so no matter how much I am exercising, and I exercise a lot, it, it, it doesn't balance out. And I will gain in the summer or what you're saying, like when cherry season happens or whatever it is, I will gain a few pounds because of the amount of sugar content. People don't want to hear that. I think it's not like a sexy thing to say because it's natural, but they'll, it's, I think it's quantity, I guess, too. But talk well, about... We were we were designed, oh, yeah, I mean, we were designed when fruit was available. And quite frankly, it was only available long ago, once a year, in the summer and, and early fall. And we were designed to eat as much as we could. Uh, two thirds of our tongue are sweet receptors. And that was because it was a way to gain weight. And a female orangutan, a great, a great example. A female orangutan eats during fruit season. 5,000 calories a day of fruit. 
She gains about 78 pounds, and then, and only then, she goes into estrus, goes into heat, and uh, becomes pregnant. It, they, her sense, uh, her body sensors say, okay, now we got enough fat to carry a pregnancy. Um, and okay, now we'll release an egg. And, you know, I see this, and there's actually entire books written about the effect of fruit eating in great apes and weight gain. Uh, whole books, because fructose, uh, we, people do not want to hear this. But fructose is a mitochondrial poison. It actually prevents the mitochondria in the liver from making ATP. Instead, it is the major driver of hepatic de novo lipogenesis, which is a fancy way of saying make fat. We detoxify fructose into two things. We detoxify it into triglycerides, which is the first storage form of fat and uric acid, which is what causes gout and it also causes hypertension. So, you know, we have a system that's designed to take fructose directly to the liver, do not pass gout, and convert it into less harmful compounds. So, I mean, that was our design, but our design wasn't to see 365 days of fruit. It just, it, it couldn't have happened. There weren't 747s bringing cherries from Argentina in, you know, November right. to, to Southern California it did not happen. So what, what do you say to people who are like, oh, the sugar that you have in fruit is not the same as the sugar, the sugar and the processed, you know, elements that are in a Milky Way or a Hershey bar? That's a great question. So half of table sugar, sucrose, is fructose. And there's a recent study that was done with uh, volunteers, giving them either glucose, sucrose, or fructose, and looking at hepatic fat generation. The glucose had absolutely no effect, but both the sucrose, the table sugar, and the fructose dramatically increased fat production in the liver. So, uh, and now almost all of our processed foods are, um, have high fructose corn syrup, which is a bit of a misnomer because high fructose corn syrup is 55% fructose and 45% glucose. So it's still oh. table sugar. So, do you, it, so it, no, it, do I say, you know, go have a Milky Way? No, I'm not saying, but what we have to understand right. is that there, the sugar load, particularly the fructose load, which is the troublemaker, uh, maybe even higher eating that healthy fruit. Well, and wow. So then are there any fruits? How about berries, blueberries, blackberries? Great question. Raspberries? Yeah. So the safest of the, of the fruits are blackberries and raspberries. They're actually followed by strawberries. Blueberries, in case anybody hasn't noticed, have been bred for size and sugar content. I mean, the organic blueberries are the size of an old grape, and it's like, and they were so bitter when I was growing up that you had to, you had to, they were tiny, and you had to put a half a cup of sugar on them to make them edible. And now, you know, you go to Costco, mm -hmm, and oh, they're so, so sweet. True. They're so sweet. <laughs> like candy. It's like candy. They, they are nature's candy. They have been yeah. bred for candy, and we we forget that. The other the other yeah. fruits that are really quite safe. Um, the little pixie tangerines actually have a fairly low sugar content. Grapefruit actually may be one of the best combos of fiber and fructose. Um, but way on the other scale, bananas and apples are some of the worst things you can eat right now for fructose content. Sorry. About apples that. even? Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Apples have been bred. For are you kidding now? We have honey crisp. Does that yeah, tell I knew you were going to say that. I mean, does that tell you anything? They have been bred for sugar. Plus, an apple, when I was growing up, was about the size of what we now consider a crab apple. Yeah. And, I mean, a, an apple is, is almost 10 times the content of what, what an apple was 50 years ago. They've been bred for sugar. I mean, but how about we'll the fiber? Buy them. 
I know we will. And because I, what I do is I just say, if I want something sweet, I'll have an apple, right? And it satiates me. But then you'll, you'll have other people who say, well, you know what, with the fiber that it has and all the other health benefits, it balances out the sugar content. So it's not, it slows down the digestion, blah, blah, blah. What do you say to something like that? So get rid of the sugar in an apple by juicing it, throw the sugar away and get the fiber and the polyphenols. That's what you're looking for. Yeah, I guess. Well, maybe. I think also it's um, you eat out of, out of boredom. And so you kind of say, oh, I'll, I'll have fruit, right? Instead of having And that's chocolate. a good point. You know, like I talked about in the book, a lot of times, particularly with COVID now, we're, people are bored. Um, and we often think that hunger, you know, that, that we're hungry. And in fact, we're not at all. And that's... One of the reasons I talk about the energy, energy snacking, whenever you get that feeling, oh, you know, I want something to eat, instead, you know, put on an iTunes song or something and dance around the room like you were talking about uh, yeah. and, you know, make a fool of yourself for three minutes. And you'll find, and studies show this, that you'll make myokines that will actually cut your hunger. And not only that, it'll actually energize your mitochondria. So the more we can recognize boredom as an opportunity to take a little exercise snack rather than to eat an apple with a, you know, with a bunch of fiber in it, there's right. far better places to get fiber than an apple. That's the point. Where would you, where, where do you think that I mean, for you? Ha have some jicama. Have some jicama. I jicama. love jicama. It's my favorite. Okay. Yeah. So there's a perfect way to get fiber that'll it's fill you up that table. doesn't have any sugar. Oh, it's everywhere now. You may not have so to. Much. You may. I, it, it, it's in Ralph's. It's in Vaughn's. It's in. Um, it's in Whole Foods. It's in Bristol Farms. It's in most of the grocery stores. Kroger. I've been in Kroger's in the Midwest. Did they you have see it? In the Midwest. Okay. I mean, I eat it all the time, and I actually thought it was so much. It was kind of a. It's my favorite. It's one of my favorite snacks, by the way. But what's the sugar content in that? Isn't that kind of high in sugar? Because it's kind of like no, a, it's a, no. It's, a, it's actually very low. It's mostly fiber. And what I tell people to do is, you know, cut up some hickama sticks and make some guacamole without tomatoes, please. Mm -hmm. And right. you can actually get <laughs> and you can buy guacamole without tomatoes. Um, and use that as your dipping stick and. And avocado is actually full of fiber as well and yeah. great monounsaturated fats. So, yeah, just have yourself a, you know, a party. And, and you'll get all the crunch you want in fruit, um, yeah. but, you, but you won't have the downsides of it. I'm glad that you brought up the tomatoes. We have to talk about the lectin. Why is lectin? Why? I mean, this is what your a lot of your book, and this is how you became such a controversial figure. Is why? What is lectin? Tell people, and why do you think it's so bad for you? For people who don't know, who haven't read the yeah. plant paradox. No. no. Okay. So uh, lectins are part of the plant defense system against being eaten, and lectins are sticky proteins and most people have heard of a lectin that they didn't know was a lectin and gluten happens to be a lectin and so if they think they're gluten intolerant uh believe it or not you're lectin intolerant and so plants uh want to protect themselves from being eaten they want to protect their seeds from being eaten which are their babies and they use literally chemical warfare to do that and so lectins are designed to actually cause leaky gut. They're designed to interrupt the communication between one nerve and another by binding to sugar molecules. They're designed to cause heart disease. I've written papers about this. They're designed to cause arthritis. And the idea is that if an animal is feeling bad when it's eating a particular plant, the smart animal says, gee, you know, every time I eat this plant, uh, I don't feel very good. And I'm going to stop eating that. I'm going to go eat something else. And the plant wins, the animal wins, everybody's happy. As all of us know, humans are very stupid. And so when we, when we eat something that, you know, disagrees with us or makes something hurt, um, we reach for you know, Tums or Nexium or Prilosec or Advil or Aleve, and we keep eating the dumb stuff. And we don't, we don't learn. I mean, one, 
One of the most fascinating facts is cows, obviously, you're supposed to eat grass. And there are grass in lect- there's lectins in grass, but the cows have a stomach that, and they've been eating grass for you know, millions of years. If you feed cows corn and soybeans, which both have lectins in them that are foreign to cows, cows will get so much heartburn that they stop eating. So half of the world's production of calcium carbonate, tums, is mixed into cattle food so that the cows will keep eating and they won't get heartburn. And so, uh, you know, anytime you see Larry the Cable Guy having a Prilosec OTC so he can have a corn dog, uh, I just uh, just kind of think about those cows. And they're a lot smarter than Larry the so, Cable Guy was. So then, so right. So then like tomatoes are something that you don't... Yeah, that, that's okay. On so, the tom- yeah, so the back, to, back to tomatoes. So... The nightshades uh, are actually American plants. Uh, They're from North, South, and Central America. And they were only brought to Europe and Asia during Colombian trade when Columbus started Colombian trade 500 years ago. So all of us uh, in America are from Europe, Asia, or Africa. So none of us were actually exposed to the nightshade family until 500 years ago. And they include potatoes, regular potatoes. They include the peppers, they include tomatoes, and they include eggplant. And oh, by the way, they include goji berries. Goji berries are actually from America. They were taken Mm. to China. Yeah, they were taken to China in trade where they grew. They were called the wolfberry in, in in America. So the Italians, for instance, refused to eat tomatoes for 200 years after their native son brought them back because they were so dangerous. And to this day, Italians always peel and de-seed tomatoes before they make pasta sauce because the peels and the seeds are where the lectins are. The Southwest American Indians who lived on peppers always peeled and de-seeded their peppers before they ate them or ground them into chili pepper. That's why the hatch chili roast exists because they knew that there was stuff that made them feel bad in the peel and the seeds. So you look at what cultures do and you go, son of a gun, you know, look at that. That's, that's why they did this. I'll give so you another example. Yeah. But wait, what does it cause? What ha- like in your, in your opinion, what does it do? Like if you, if for people who eat tomatoes or nightshades, what is the, like the cause and effect, like what will happen? Where are some so of the things cause, that can happen? Yeah, so it'll cause leaky gut. It'll actually break open the lining of the wall of your gut and allows food particles and bacteria to get through the wall of your gut. And on the other side of the wall of your gut, and the wall of your gut is the same surface area as a tennis court inside of us. And tennis court. In there. Really? Yeah, and it's wow. only one cell thick. Only one cell thick. Wow. And so 80% of all of our immune system, 80% of all of our white blood cells line the lining of our gut because that's the border where mischief can come through. And so that is actually the cause of inflammation. And people talk about, oh, I eat all these anti-inflammatory foods. It's like us living in Southern California and there's a forest fire and we're trying to protect our roof with a garden hose. Um, right. The forest fire is caused by, in this case, leaky gut and our immune system causing inflammation. And, and, and so that's what you think eggplants, uh, nightshades, whatever, tomatoes, yeah, that's what that's, how, that's what causes it. That's the that's root. What, of- yeah. In fact, it's interesting. My, uh, my grandmother on my mother's side was French and she always taught my mother to peel and de tomatoes because, uh, you know, everybody knew that. And uh, yeah. it wasn't until I went to Yale as an undergraduate that I actually had my first sliced tomato with a peel and a seed. And it was the weirdest thing. I said, well, why wouldn't anybody eat you know, this? And wow. uh, when, I, when I was over in England doing my fellowship in children's heart surgery, I had an Italian house officer uh, who I decided to surprise him. I was going to make 
you know, spaghetti and pasta sauce from scratch. So I invited him down, you know, to, to the flat and I got out a can of tomatoes and, you know, open up the can and you know, throw them in the sauce. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, what do you mean? I'm making tomato sauce. He said, you can't do that. There's peels and seeds. He, he says, you're trying to kill me. And I said, what are you talking about? And then I went, oh my gosh, you know, my mother. And he said, I said, I've forgotten all about that. He said, of course, anybody knows you, you know, you, the peels and the seeds will kill you. True really? Story. That is correct. That's really amazing. So because it's such a common thing, right? Like everyone eats pizza here and puts tomatoes on literally everything, a burger. And so do, how do people know, like, what are the symptoms of leaky gut? Cause I think that Again, you don't know what you don't know. What does it kind of appear to be if you don't know the term le leaky gut or if you have some kind of yeah. ailment and you don't know what it is? So Hippocrates, 2,500 years ago, said all disease begins in the gut. And the, the guy he was a genius. He was actually absolutely right. And I've paraphrased that to say all disease begins in a leaky gut. And so if, if you have, if you have an autoimmune disease, I guarantee you, you have a leaky gut. And the reason I guarantee you that is about 80% 80, 80 of my practice now is autoimmune patients who have been everywhere and aren't getting any better. And we have a 90 plus percent success rate in getting rid of autoimmune diseases once we teach them how to seal their leaky gut. If you have heart disease, you have a leaky gut. If you have dementia, you have a leaky gut. If you have high blood pressure, you have a leaky gut. Um, if you've got eczema, you got a leaky gut. You got acne, you got a leaky gut. I know I sound like you know, it's all just one thing, but in fact, we see that when when we test for people, and we can do blood tests for leaky gut now, all these people have leaky gut, and then when we watch it go away, um, everything goes away. They're really, I'm going to write that. Write that down. Let, let me give you a great example of a woman from yesterday. Um, she's about 50 years of age. She had horrible Crohn's disease. And Crohn's disease is one of those autoimmune diseases of the gut, which is, and she was on multiple medications and she was incredibly depressed all of her life, horribly depressed, seeing psychiatrists on antidepressants. And she, you know, came to, you know, realize that she was just a depressed individual and she was going to have to take all this. Long story short, she no longer has Crohn's disease. She no longer has bloody bowel movement. She no longer has abdominal pain. And I saw her uh, just for a six month review. Was, we've had her for about two years now. And she said, you're a miracle worker. And I said, no, no, I just taught you how to eat. She said, no. She said, my depression is gone. She said, my depression is gone. I fired my psychiatrist. I don't take any antidepressants anymore. She said, my depression is gone. And you wrote that this was going to happen. How did you know? I said, because depression is coming from your microbiome and from your leaky gut. And when we seal that, it all goes away. And even wow. you know, Daniel Amen has now come, ar come around to saying that most of what we've been calling mental illness is actually a gut illness and if we fix the gut uh, everything will be just fine i mean women in particular you guys know you have a gut sense and yes. you know men should have listened to you long ago um, that's for sure you guys, you guys are far more in tune with well, you know your bodies than we are than men okay I, I i think so i think you're right about that but maybe i'm being biased um can we, I want to talk about this and how, what kind of tests can people take to see if they have leaky gut and then how can we seal our leaky gut? Yeah. Give us some, give us some pointers on how to do these All things. All right. So, so there are tests that people can, um, a physician has to order them, uh, that can actually identify leaky gut. Um, you're looking for markers for what's called anti-zonulin, Z O. L U L I N. Uh, this zonulin was discovered by Dr. Fasano, who's now at Harvard. And he was actually the first to prove how gluten, which is a lectin, actually caused leaky gut by breaking the little tight junctions that hold our little cells together in our gut. And he 
figured out the mechanism. And so we can measure, you know, anti-zonulin and anti-actin. But there are easier ways to do it. If you have, number one, if you have an autoimmune disease or been told or suspect you do, if you have like Hashimoto's thyroiditis, like 60 million women now have, um, you have a leaky gut. Um, Kelly Clarkson is one of the great success stories. She found my book. She had Hashimoto's thyroiditis. She was on thyroid medication. She followed my program without ever meeting me. Her Hashimoto's resolved. She came off of thyroid medication just by reading the dump book. Wow. So, Good yeah. story. Yeah, good story. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and you have people, I guess it works. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It works. <laughs> You know, so I, you know, this isn't conjecture on my part. For the last over 20 years now, I see patients six days a week uh, in my two clinics, and we do blood work on them every three months. And we watch what happens when we take a food away or put a food back, and we see what the inflammation markers are, we see what their insulin levels are, and, you know, we, we can learn. Uh, I've written in my dedications, you know, most everything I've learned is from my patients, you know, in a way right. being my, being my guinea pigs. Right. So then tell us a couple of ways we can do this, like how we can help. Okay. Cure so it, it, yeah, it, it's, it's not what I tell you to eat. That's important. It's what I tell you not to eat. And uh, <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Um, the one thing most people with leaky gut have a very low vitamin D level. And if you do nothing else, everybody who's listening, take a minimum of 5,000 international units of vitamin D. Particularly during COVID, there's now 17 different studies showing that the higher your vitamin D level, the safer you are from getting COVID. And if you get COVID, it will be a mild illness. Um, and certainly mm -hmm. we've seen that in our patient population. So that's number one. Number two, try to eliminate um, or reduce lectin-containing foods. And those are all the grains, pseudo-grains, corn, uh, except sorghum and millet. Sorghum and millet don't have any lectins. And there's even sorghum popcorn, which tastes exactly like popcorn. It's phenomenal. Really? Like I never little, heard of that. It, it smells like popcorn. It tastes like popcorn. You can buy it pre-popped uh, on the internet. Where do you buy it? How do you spell it? Sorghum, S-O-R-G-H-U-M. I've never seen it. I'm going to look for it. Was Whole, like, Whole Foods have it? it or? Yeah, Whole Foods will have it. Um, but go on the internet. Go, go wherever your provider is. Go to Thrive Market. Go to Amazon. And look for popped sorghum. And there's lots of different varieties now i like I that can, okay okay what you said, can, you I said what? A, can i give a shout out to the to the brand i buy go ahead shout uh, out whoever you want nature nates popped Nate. sorghum don't i don't All know right. never met met him or her but nature nates i like it okay. okay i'm gonna look it up i'm gonna i'm gonna uh buy Check some of that there's, there's even cassava flour pasta. Um, there's a company called Jovial that comes out of Italy. And by the way, speaking of de defusing lectins, pressure cooking destroys all lectins except gluten and the lectin and oats. So there's now two companies that make pressure cooked beans. Eden brand beans are all pressure cooked. And this new company, Jovial, just like a happy person, um, they not only soak their beans, but also pressure cook them, and they come in a glass jar. So uh, people say, oh, you're trying to scare people from eating beans. I have Jovial or eating beans probably three times a week, uh, every week. So you just have to diffuse these lectins. Okay, so what, give, me one, give oh, me one yeah. more uh, way to steal it. Stay, so you said... Yes. Lectin, so, yes, just said vitamin D. Pressure cook. Yeah. Pressure cook. And stay, right, stay away from peanuts and cashews. Peanuts and cashews. Mm. Cashews, peanuts too. And cashews. I love that. There is, I can't tell you the number, particularly of women, 
who have gut issues and we take their cashews away from them. The dermatologic literature is full of rashes from eating cashews. There's even cashew pickers disease that you get horrible welts and blisters on your hands from picking cashews. Why? Why cashews? Why? why? What's well, the, they like? don't want you to eat their baby. And oh the cashew gosh. is one of the few seeds that's on the outside of a fruit. So to protect that, they put the, the plant puts lectins on. In fact, I've been I've done mission work in Brazil many times, and the Brazilians laugh. They pull the cashew seed off and throw it away, and they eat the fruit. They say, nobody eats them. You know, nobody eats the, the nut. Are you kidding? Wow. I love cashews. That's so disappointing. I used to, too. I know. It's a pain in the neck. It but. really is. You talk about a couple of other. Okay, I wanted to ask you about um, the other one. You say, I have here how, you know, basically how inflammation affects our energy. And you talk about the three L's. We talked about leaky gut. We talked about lectins. What's the other one? LPSs lipopolysaccharides and oh, wow. they're better That's known it. in my books as little pieces of oh wow. okay why tell us what I, they are and why okay so bacteria die in our gut and certain class of bacteria particularly bacteria that love simple sugars and saturated fats what i call gang members they the cell wall of that bacteria has a really sneaky system of getting into us. Fats are absorbed in a very different way than sugars and proteins. They actually hop a ride on a molecule called a chylomicron. And the chylomicron goes through the wall of our gut and then goes into our lymph system. It actually doesn't go into our bloodstream. So LPSs actually hide in chylomicrons and right across the wall of our gut. And our immune system doesn't know the difference between a living bacteria and a piece of bacteria, the cell wall of a bacteria. So our immune system doesn't want to make a mistake and assumes we're being invaded by bacteria. And you can actually prove this with healthy volunteers. We can take LPSs, which are sterile, they're not living, and we can inject them into the arm of a healthy person, and they will instantaneously go into septic shock as if we had just given them a bolus of poop into their veins. Septic shock, even though we didn't inject them with anything living. The immune system assumed it was bacteria. So imagine that happening. Every time you eat processed foods and these guys ride through the wall of our gut and our immune system goes, oh my gosh, there's you know, bacteria everywhere and we need to put up a fight. And so they not only cause inflammation in your gut, but these are then transported to the liver where we have another set of fighters willing to fight with them. And that's one of the biggest causes of what, is now called fatty liver disease. And fatty liver disease is, is an epidemic in this country. So fructose and LPSs, you get fatty liver disease, boom. Wow, and where, do, where are these LPSs? Like where, where, how do we avoid them at all? Like how do we avoid so them? So you avoid them by not having fats that they can ride on, number one. And number two, most of our gut buddies, the good bacteria, don't make these LPSs. So unfortunately, most of us have tons of gang members in our gut. Um, and so you just have to, you got to eat to feed your gut buddies what they want to eat. You really want to avoid saturated fats for the most part. There's a few good ones. Uh, I'm not demonizing fat. A guy who tells you to have a liter of olive oil per week exactly. is not demonizing fat. Absolutely not. So, um, so basically, like you, were, you, we want to make sure our mitochondria is being optimized, right? That's basically what we're all. This is what we're talking about, yep. um, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's and all you talk about the mitochondria. 
It's all about the mitochondria. And you say that melatonin is the number one booster of its efficiency by, by taking me- or, or melatonin it optimizes the mo- mitochondria. Uh, now, is that like the pill, like the, you know, pills that you take? Like I know people take melatonin to fall asleep. And I actually heard a lot of things about that too, that, that basically melatonin is a hormone and it's not good to take. Can you give us some information on this whole thing? Sure. Um, first of all, mel- melatonin is one of the two principal mitochondrial antioxidants. The one thing that people should realize, you could swallow all the antioxidants in the world and they will not help your mitochondria, uh, period. They will not help. So if I take one of those melatonin, oh, okay, Mike, yeah. Okay. So melatonin is actually present in food. And plants produce melatonin to protect their mitochondria, just like polyphenols. Mm. And so there are some great sources of melatonin in food. Number one source, highest source is pistachio nuts, by far, number one source, pistachio nuts, loaded with melatonin. Coffee has melatonin. Olive oil has melatonin. Uh, Tea has melatonin. The mushroom family are full of melatonin. And it turns out that many people, including me, believe that one of the huge benefits of a Mediterranean diet and the drinking of, for instance, red wine is that it's actually the melatonin in these Mm. things that's actually making the difference in health rather than some other miracle compound or the diet altogether. So, and I've got a whole list in the book on where to find melatonin. Interesting, you should mention taking high dose melatonin. There's some interesting research now in dementia of giving people uh, 40 or more milligrams of melatonin uh, during the day. Uh, I've done this with a number of patients now. It does not make you sleepy. Uh, One of the things I think people are going to have to realize is that we've always associated melatonin with sleep. But in fact, melatonin is produced during the night. And during the night is when we would not be eating and our mitochondria need to undergo repair and rest. And so we, rather than we should think of melatonin as a sleep hormone, we should look at melatonin for its original purpose. And that was as an antioxidant to repair mitochondria and protect them. And when you do that, you go, oh, wait a minute. It's not a sleep hormone. It's produced at night to repair our mitochondria. So no wonder these melatonin-rich foods are good for us. And potentially, no wonder a lot of melatonin as a supplement may be very useful. We've just gotten it completely 180 degrees wrong. Where did it come from then? Like, you know, it's very common. You hear people like, oh, I took a couple of melatonin because I couldn't sleep. Or yeah, I gotta well, take mel- yeah. The, it, it will have an effect on sleep, but there's actually even easier ways to generate sleep, like I talk about in the book. One of the coolest tricks is to take glycine, which is an amino, absol- amino acid that you can get in a capsule. Take about three grams, three capsules before you go to bed, and glycine actually lowers your body temperature. And it's lowering a body temperature that actually initiates sleep. And it's, it's a really cool effect. I've never heard of that one before. That's a good it's one. In the book. Besides, I mean, I know I'm saying yeah. it's, not, yeah. it's not one of those common yeah. things that you hear about. You always hear about melatonin right. or whatever yeah. else. Yeah. And so uh, that's a good one. I like that. Can you talk a little bit more um, just, I, I, I really like this because I heard you speak about this before about some other immune system stuff, immune system boosters, because people are really con- are still concerned about that. You talked about a bunch, like having time release vitamin C, for example. Yeah. What's the difference between taking a vitamin C, you know, you pop in your mouth and one that's time released? So vitamin C is a, is a water-soluble vitamin, and we have no storage system for vitamin C. We actually are one of the few animals that don't produce our own vitamin C. We, there is a, a five-step process to manufacture vitamin C from, believe it or not, glucose. 
Um, and in us, the final gene, the final enzyme is a ghost gene. It's turned off. Now, we think that's because manufacturing vitamin C is expensive. And if you're surrounded in an environment where you're eating a lot of vitamin C rich foods, like in the jungle, then why would you bother having an enzyme system to manufacture vitamin C from sugar? Because you'd much rather have the sugar for storing fat. So that's the theory. So great apes don't make vitamin C. Uh, we don't make vitamin C. Guinea pigs don't make vitamin C. So uh, why is it so important? Vitamin C is actually the major um, weapon that white blood cells use to destroy particularly bacteria and viruses. And there's a fascinating system that was discovered by Linus Pauling back in the 50s that your white blood cells can concentrate vitamin C I think 50-fold over the vitamin C that's in your circulation. And they use that vitamin C as a nuclear weapon when they engulf uh, bacteria or viruses and just blow them up. When you consume vitamin C, it only lasts for two or three hours and it's gone. Mm. Time-release vitamin C, uh, you have vitamin C throughout that time period. Uh, and let me give you the longevity pitch. You can breed mice to carry the human gene uh, to not make vitamin C. And these mice will live only half as long as their normal mice colleagues. You put vitamin C in their drinking water and they will come back and live just as long as their normal. But it was in their drinking water and they're always drinking. So we need a couple, two time release vitamin C or get yourself some chewable tablets and chew one four times a day. And here's another fun fact. Yeah. We're not, research in humans has shown that drinking a glass of orange juice will, will paralyze the ability of your white blood cells to engulf bacteria for five hours after you drank that healthy orange juice. Wow, really? Really? Wow, I didn't even that's crazy. That's yeah, amazing. So, I I yeah, I never heard no, I never heard that either. Just remember, I'm, juice is constant concentrated fructose. It's concentrated it's like, sugar. It, it's I am. just mainlining sugar. I mean, that's why the one thing I have to say, uh, this whole juice craze, you know, oh, I'm juicing, I'm juicing, I'm juicing. I ne I was never someone who got behind it for the, just for obvious reasons. I mean, the amount of sugar, um, yeah. but I, but I did rationalize the amount of fruit I ate because I thought because I'm eating the fiber content, I'm eating the actual fruit. I'm not juicing it. It wasn't bad and it wasn't affecting me. Um, so that's why, but I know just as like, you're, if you're taking out all the fiber and juice, it's obviously, I mean, anyway, not to like keep on repeating myself, but there were a couple other. Uh, I'm, I'm going to get you on rev I'm reverse juicing craze. You're, you're going to, you're going to become my apostle for this. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't juice. I don't juice. I only eat fruit. No, reverse eat, juice. Yeah. Reverse Throw the juice, juice away. Get the fiber, oh, the fiber in the exactly, bowl. Exactly. I am going to try that, but it's probably not as tasty, right? Because you're taking out the sugar, right? Like it's super hard. You'd be, you so, know what? You'd be. You, Stir in a little allulose or stevia or monk fruit and you'll be fine. Are you okay with, I was going to ask you, are you okay with stevia? Are you okay with monk fruit? Is, are those okay sugar substitutes or yeah they're, they're fine they're safe allulose is my new favorite that i talk about in the book yeah which is actually do. which is it's actually a natural rare sugar why uh, do you like discovered. that better than monk it's food actually or? it's now been proven to be a true prebiotic it actually fosters the growth of beneficial bacteria so it's why not yeah uh, my other favorite sugar is called just like sugar uh, which is pretty much pure inulin, and inulin is the best prebiotic there is for gut bugs. Where do you find that? So inulin is present in the chicory family of vegetables. So radicchio, Belgian endive, curly endive, chicory 
Uh, it's present in, um, believe it or not, it's present in jicama. It's present oh. in asparagus is another great place to find. Oh, I love that. That's a and, really good one. And how about Steve? Tell me what you think of stevia overall. I, dr- I so, do read a lot of that. Yeah, stevia, there are some studies that suggest stevia will change the microbiome. One of the important things is you, you have sweet re- receptors on your tongue. You don't have sugar receptors on your tongue. And they're sweet receptors to tell your brain that sugar from fruit is on the way, make some insulin, get ready to store fat. When sugar doesn't arrive, when you've used an artificial or a, a, a non-caloric sweetener, your brain says, wait a minute, uh, you told me the sugar was coming. I got the message. I'm all set for it. Um, where is it? You, you got cheated. Go back and get some more. Um, when I was drinking eight Diet Cokes a day and was 70 pounds heavier, uh, you know, I was going, what do I have? I've never Diet Cokes. What the deal? And my brain was always going, you got cheated. Go go find some more or something to eat. And right. it's, so, and it, stevia actually increases your insulin level. So retreat from sweet. You don't have to throw it away, but you have to shorten it. Yeah, you got to manage it more. Can you give me a yep. couple other like kind of not so mainstream things to actually improve your immune system? Not, not the ones that we commonly hear. Like, well, and, and, yeah. So uh, your immune system is, like I talk in the book, is on overload because of leaky gut. And so mm-hmm. anything you do to repair leaky gut will improve your immune system. That's why during COVID, everybody heard, if you have a pre-existing condition, you're a setup for the cytokine storm. Pre-existing conditions, by definition, is you have a leaky gut. That's why you have a pre-existing condition. And you fix that, everything goes back to normal. And it's it, never too late. What, yeah, that's true. Exactly. You can always improve yourself. What about zinc? What does zinc do? Yeah, so zinc, um, there's a new study that shows zinc isn't all that interesting. Uh, oh, too many okay. people, yeah, yeah. Uh, too many people take too much zinc. Zinc has to be balanced with copper. Maximum recommendation for me is only about 50 milligrams a day. Don't exceed it. Um, at that level, it has some interesting help for repairing uh, leaky gut, but don't exceed it. And the one thing I wanted to ask you that you talk about in your book, and I think it's a very timely because of the ketogenic diet, we haven't really, we talked about time restricted uh, eating, but, uh, and I found this interesting is that you said that keto, the, the ketogenic diet is only effective within a time restricting feeding. If you just do it, if you just do keto without that time restricted diet plan, it's not effective. I think that's interesting. Well, so, yeah, the ketogenic diet um, has a failure rate of over 60%. I'm surprised and, not more. How do people yeah, stay on it? I don't know. but Well, that's, that's part of the problem. Uh, it's a non-sustainable diet. And you can get literally uh, all the benefits of a ketogenic diet and a lot of the, lo- avoiding the downsides by just time-restricted eating. You, know, you will... You will generate ketones during the time you're fasting if you keep your insulin level low. And the book tells you how to do this. And isn't there like something that, I mean, you're the doctor that people can overdo the ketogenic diet too, and there could be the reverse effect. Oh, yeah. Um, People somehow seem to forget that fat has nine calories per uh, gram. Protein and sugar has four calories per gram. And so by the same weight, you have over two times the amount of calories per gram. And so I see these people and, you know, oh, I'm on a ketogenic diet and all oh, I'm eating fat bombs throughout the day and I'm gaining weight. And I, I'm going, what? Well, yeah, um, you know, guess what? You're, you're eating a 10,000 calorie a day diet and right. you can't overcome, you know, basic biochemistry right. and yet all, all this out there is oh my gosh you know eat 12 sticks of butter every day uh you know i have a pint of sour cream on top of your keto ice cream and it's like no folks there's certain rules that you know still apply here absolutely so do you believe in calories in calories out or no not, that's no, absolutely simple. not true okay that's just, not true 
Oh, right. But so then, but you're saying but you, you can get to a point right, where, where you will, just, you, know, you will overcome. Well, no, calories in and calories out. Do you remember Atkins diet? It's like the Atkins oh, yeah. diet though. It's like, it it's all just diet. derivatives of these old diets. And that the Atkins diet was actually the drinking, the derivative of the drinking man's diet that was uh, sold two and a half million copies, Robert Cameron, uh, the oh. drinking man's diet. And uh, it what basically said, you get rid of all carbohydrates and you can have booze. You can have gin, you can have vodka, you can have bourbon. Because uh, there weren't any, uh, there weren't any uh, carbohydrates, and it but was incredibly carbs. popular. Not, not in straight uh, booze. Oh, not, no in, not in tequila or, but in, in beer, there's tons. No, there is beer. That's not straight booze. Yeah, wine is not straight. Beer. I guess you're right. Yeah. You're saying like hard liquor. Yeah, hard liquor, exactly. Yeah, hard. Liquor. And interestingly enough, he was called a mass murderer by the you know, Harvard <laughs> Nutrition School, and he actually he actually lived to ninety six years old. He was actually celebrated the fiftieth anniversary of his of his book. No kidding. Edition. Well, maybe his diet no, works. Okay, I'll we'll leave everybody with that. But check check out the uh, no, don't check out the yeah. <laughs> no, check but, out but, your yeah, these book. Are all, these are these are all just variations of a theme. Oh, absolutely. Uh, well, listen, I mean, I think basically, I think I've asked you pr pretty much a lot of different things. I have a few other things, you know, I didn't get to, but um, they could pick up your book, Energy Paradox, and they could check it out themselves about uh, inflammation, how to have a healthy mitochondria, which is good for your energy and your other books too. You have like, how many books do you have now? Oh, I think we're up to seven. Um, yeah. Wow. Wow. You're writing a lot of books. Oh, and I wow. also got your thing in the mail. Thank you. It was like um, you sent it to me. Uh, basically, it's a scoop of Vital Red. Is that what it's called? Oh, yeah. Vital Reds. Yeah. Polyphenols. Poly Polyphenols. So, yeah. So what I did with Vital Reds was my original product. I took the benefits of fruits and got rid of the sugar and dehydrated it. So it's just a blast of polyphenols without all the sugar. I'm actually so going to try it now. Next time you reach for your apple, I have a scoop of vital reds. I think you'll be impressed. That's why I was thinking about it. I'm like, I, I, in my head, as I was, I was wrapping this up, I'm like, I'm kind of hungry. Maybe I'll have an apple. And then I said, mm, I'm going to try that. I'll try a cup of that and let you know a glass of that, I should say. Um, <laughs> But thank you so much for being on the podcast. Why don't you tell people about where to find you? No, you're great. Um, so they, they can go to drgundry.com. They can find my supplement food company, gundrymd.com, uh, the Dr. Gundry podcast, which you've appeared on. Um, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I have two YouTube channels. Uh, two. You can find me. Two. Why two? Uh, different names. Oh, what's the, what's the names? Dr. Gundry and Gundry or and MD? Gundry MD, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, thank you so much. This is great. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to share this episode and I'm excited to have my episode being shared. And, you know, we'll, I'll let you know how I, how I like the Vital Red. All right, great. Yeah, give me feedback. Thanks. Absolutely. All right. All right, thanks very much. Habits and hustle, time to get it rolling. Stay up on the grind, don't stop, keep it going. Habits and hustle from nothing into something. All out, hosted by Jennifer Cohen. Visionaries, tune in, you can get to know them. Be inspired, this is your moment. Excuses, we ain't having that. The Habits and Hustle Podcast, powered by Habit Nest.